Okay, let's go ahead and learn the rule of universal introduction. So universal introduction is just the reverse of the rule we first learned, universal elimination. So rather than remove a quantifier and insert a name for every occurrence of the variable, what we do is we add a quantifier and insert a variable for every occurrence of a name. Now, if you think about this for a bit, it doesn't really seem like we should be able to do it. So you take something like, F.A. Say, Alfred is funny. Should we ever be able to go from F.A. to, say, for all X, F.X.? Well, no, really, that doesn't seem like we should ever be able to do that. It doesn't follow from the fact that Alfred is funny, that everything is funny, and it never will. So the question really is, why would we ever permit something like universal introduction? So let's see if we can understand why we'd want to permit it. So think about this uh, proof. For all x, if f of x, then g of x. For all x, f of x. Therefore, for all x, g of x. So we could interpret that as meaning Everything that's funny is goofy. For all x, if x is funny, then x is goofy. And in fact, everything is funny. So everything that's funny is goofy. And by the way, everything is funny. Shouldn't that imply that everything is goofy? Well, the answer is yes. So let's see if we can prove it. So we have two assumptions. And then we can do some familiar things. We can go to f of a by 1 in universal elimination, and we can go to if f of a, then g of a by 2 in universal elimination. And then we can get g of a. But now what we want is for all x, g of x. We want to be able to go here from a is goofy to everything is goofy. Now that seems very much like what we said we shouldn't be able to do with Alfred. But Intuitively, it seems like in this proof, we should be able to. So what makes this proof different so that we'd want to license this kind of inference? Well, the answer is essentially that although we chose A here, we didn't really care what name we used. We could have used B, we could have used C, we could have used D. Any name would have worked here. And what that shows you really is that a isn't Alfred. A isn't anybody at all. A is just some name. And that's the condition that we need to preserve. If A really isn't the name of any one individual, but just some name that we need so that we can prove things, then it's going to be okay to do a universal introduction. So what we need to do is state restrictions that actually meet that basic requirement so that the constant we're introducing on doesn't mean any one individual. So how do we do that? It turns out to be pretty simple. What we do is we make sure that the name for which we're introducing a particular variable and quantifier does not occur in any assumption and it does not occur in any undischarged hypothesis, which is essentially an assumption, right? If it hasn't been discharged, it's operating as an assumption. So as long as the name isn't occurring in an assumption or an undischarged hypothesis, it's going to be okay to do that. And the third restriction is just the requirement that when we do introduce a variable, uh, for this rule, we make sure that we introduce it for every occurrence of the name in the formula. So if A is in the formula, we introduce the variable X, it's got to go in for every occurrence. And that's very similar to uh, the rule of universal elimination. Okay, so this proof actually can be done like this, right? For all X, G of X is the last uh, step in the proof. 5 in universal introduction. Why is that? Because if you look at, there are no hypotheses, and if you look at the two assumptions, A does not occur in either one. So we're good.
Okay, so let's see if we can spot some errors. Here's a proof with two errors. Stop the video and see if you can figure out which ones they are. So the first one is one that comes from uh, universal elimination. Uh, in fact, there's two mistakes being made here. You can't on line three, you cannot uh, operate on anything but the main operator. And here the, the universal quantifiers are not the main operators. And of course, you can't operate on two quantifiers at once. The mistake more relevant to us here, though, is step uh, five where we have substituted uh, a variable x for a and introduced the universal quantifier, right? So that's legitimate um, until we start looking at the restrictions. So look, what we have to do is we have to say, before we do this, does a occur in any assumption or live hypothesis? And we look up here and in fact, A is in an assumption, so we're not allowed to do that. So that's an illegitimate move. Now here's another one. See if you can uh, spot the errors here. So steps three and four should be uh, universal elimination. Again, otherwise they're okay. The main uh, problem, as far as something that's just never going to be okay, is step six. Now, why is step six not okay? Well, here we've introduced, we have universal introduction on five. We look at five, okay. What we've done is we've put a variable in for A, attached the universal quantifier, so we've gone from GA to for all Y, G of Y. But in order for that to be legitimate, A cannot occur in any assumption, which it does not, or any live hypothesis. Now notice, or by live I mean undischarged. Now here, look at the hypothesis. It is at this point, at line six, it has not been discharged. It gets discharged at line seven. So if you think about this particular move, doing it at exactly this point, a is still in an undischarged hypothesis, and so we can't do it for that reason. Okay, go ahead and take a look at this one for a moment and see if you can figure out what's wrong with this. All right, so here the problem isn't about the first two restrictions about not introducing when the constants in A or the name is within A uh, assumption or an undischarged hypothesis. Here the problem is that we violated the third restriction and we haven't substituted the variable for every occurrence of the name. So you'll see that this says two universal introduction. We've substituted an X, we've, we've substituted an X for this A, but we've left this A alone and that's something we can't do. So in order to do this properly, we would have had to write for all x, fx, gx. And of course, that's not what we were looking for. So this proof isn't something that we're able to complete. Now, how about this one? Well, this one's actually just fine. There's nothing wrong with this proof at all. What, what have we done? Well, we've seen that we have a, a conditional statement here. This is a very common way of proving quantified theorems. We see a conditional statement here, and we say, oh, I wonder if I could prove a specific instance of this and then introduce the universal quantifier, which is what we did. So we have hypothesized FA, and then we have just uh, concluded not not FA by one and double negation, which is perfectly fine. And so we have now shown if FA, then not not FA. 
Now, you might have initially thought, well, you can't, okay, you can't just introduce the universal quantifier here, but in fact, we can. Why is that? Well, because A does occur in a hypothesis, but now the hypothesis has been discharged. It's no longer available for us to use in the proof, so we aren't violating the, uh, the restriction to not introduce a quantifier on a, uh, an undischarged hypothesis. All right, so we'll finish here by making a formal statement of the universal induction, introduction rule. So this says, for any formula P, which is just any formula at all in predicate logic, which may or may not include variables, but which does include at least one or more uh, name letters, A, right? Then for any variable V, we may infer for all V P where V is substituted for every occurrence of A and P, but only under the following conditions. A does not occur in any assumption, and A does not occur in any undischarged hypothesis. All right, so let's just finish up with a few study questions.